So hello everybody, it's nice to see you all here today. Greetings from Slovenia, from the mountains. It's a pleasure to introduce Sara Kalishnik Veroshek, who will talk today about learning algebraic varieties from samples. Sara, please. Um, hi everyone, and uh, well, um, greetings from Boston as well, um, where I'm calling you from. Uh, so I will talk about, uh, so uh, I just started as an assistant professor at Wesleyan, but last year I was a postdoc at the Max Planck Institute in Leipzig. Um, and this is one of the projects that we, that, we, um, that uh, I worked on while I was there. And it's joint work with Paul Breiding, Bernd Sturmfels, and Madeleine Weinstein. Um, and sort of before I get started, um, so how like, did we get to doing this project? Um, well, the group in Leipzig uh, specializes in what we would like, uh, in what we, like, we would say is like applied algebra. Um, and uh, in Bernd Sturmfels, who is the director of our, who is director of, uh, like, of the group I was in, uh, he's very excited about varieties. And um, so somehow because uh, I work in TDA and um, um, that group does a lot of algebraic varieties. Um, we start, like we started talking about, um, uh, I mean, like uh, sort of different approaches to analyzing data. Um, and uh, one of the things that he was unhappy about was that like everybody keeps talking about manifolds whenever um, we get to um, like modeling data or talking about different algorithms, but nobody likes to talk about varieties. Um, and uh, so uh, we said that we would uh, try to look into, um, I mean, at least, I mean, because this is sort of still in the early stage, we would try to see what we can say about varieties. Uh, in particular, linear spaces that everybody deals with are varieties. Um, so in that sense, like we're trying to study like a structure that is uh, a little bit more general. Um, so I will, uh, so the, I structured the talk as follows. Um, because I'm expecting a, diver a diverse audience, I'm not going to assume that you already know all the definition from algebraic uh, geometry, um, so I'll start with that. Um, and then uh, I will uh, say, like, uh, I will talk about sort of what the problems, like what the, pro like what we, uh, the answers, uh, what the questions we were trying to answer were, um, and what the setting of our problem is, and what we did. Um, and uh, so in particular, one of the contributions um, is a software package in Julia, Learning Algebraic Varieties, um, and I'm going to end by showing you uh, some examples uh, like of that. Uh, so if we get started, uh, uh, what is an algebraic variety? Uh, if we have polynomials f1 through fr uh, with coefficients uh, in r, uh, then there's a common zero set is an algebraic variety v. And um, varieties live in uh, like in Euclidean space uh, or like in uh, complex spaces. So these are called affine varieties. Uh, but then additionally, if all the fi are homogeneous, uh, then they live in what we call projective spaces and they're called projective varieties. Um, so we have a picture of a paraboloid uh, over here on slide one. So this is the zero set of polynomial z minus x squared minus y squared, and this is one example uh, of a variety. Um, and then there are others. So one that will um, appear throughout my talk is the so-called trot curve, um, given by the equi like equation that you see here. Um, and so this is an example um, of a quartic. Um, and uh, so we know uh, that like generic plane quartic, uh, quartics over uh, like have um, 20, 28 by tangent lines. And this curve is very special because um, all of these are real in this case. And you can see them on the picture uh, on the right. So these are by tangents. Um, this was proved in 1879 by Cayley. Um, so then another uh, example that we're going to look at is of uh, the group SO3, which consists of all three by three matrices um, uh, with determinant uh, one um, and sort of the, the, the condition with uh, X transpose times X is the identity. Um, so if we um, uh, translate um, all of the constraints on the entries of the matrix, uh, what we get is nine quadratic equations. Um, and uh, so, uh, so this is sort of for the orthogonal, like, like for matrix being orthogonal, and then additionally for the determinant, uh, we get 
the, the last polynomial. Um, and this defines SO3 as a variety in R9. Um, and now, uh, so I mentioned already earlier um, that we have two types of varieties. So on one hand, we have real varieties, and then on the other hand, we have projective varieties. Um, and one of the things that we were looking at is, so um, in TDA, um, it's uh, like uh, we, uh, it's like the objects of interest are metric spaces. And um, depending on whether we work in a variety um, with an affine or a projective variety and what the ambient space is, we can choose different metrics. Um, and we looked a little bit into how that affects uh, the results that we get. Um, in particular, when we have real varieties, um, what we used is the standard Euclidean metric um, uh, uh, induced by the usual inner product, um, whereas in, like in the case of projective varieties, uh, we use the so-called Fubini Studi metric. Um, so, basic, so, like, so what, what is that? So if we have um, two uh, points in a projective plane, so these basically represent um, two lines if like we lift everything to Euclidean space and then the Fubini studi distance between uh, these two is going to be the angle bet between the lines that they span. Um, and uh, so here you can see like what the explicit formula is. Um, and so if you are an algebraic uh, geometer, um, what are the things that you're going to want to like know, learn about uh, your variety? Um, so um, you're going to want to um, uh, like to find vanishing equations, but then in particular, um, you're going to want to say what uh, the dimension of a variety is. Uh, so how is the dimension of a variety uh, defined? Uh, so it is the maximum integer such that there exists uh, v0 included in v1, included in uh, up to vd. Um, where all of uh, where all the subsets are prop uh, are proper, and uh, each of these vi's uh, is an irreducible variety, uh, which means it sort of it can't be um, broken down um, into simpler bits. Um, so yeah, so for example, if we think of uh, so a circle um, is one is also an example um, of a variety. Um, and it has uh, dimension one. I mean, and like for the circle, I'm, like if it's centered, so like the equation would be x squared plus y squared equals one, like for the unit circle, um, and the dimension um, is one. Uh, and then another, uh, uh, another property uh, that we're interested in is uh, the degree of a variety. Um, so the degree is the number of intersection points of the variety with the hyperplanes and general position. Um, so if we have um, our circle, um, then we, like the hyperplane um, is going to be a line, and if we take a generic one, um, uh, uh, intersection of a circle and a line, we get two. So that would be the degree um, of the circle. Um, so, okay, so equipped with this, uh, so, so, so roughly, so this is what a variety is, and these are some of the properties of varieties that we wish to um, that we wish to learn. Um, but okay, so if we now like go to the other side um, and uh, like I guess in data science um, we work with samples. Uh, so our assumption was uh, that we are given a finite sample of points um, either in Euclidean space or in projective space and that it comes from an unknown variety. Uh, I mean this is sort of like very like loosely defined. Um, and uh, the goal was learn as much information about this uh, variety V as possible. Um, so in particular, uh, going back to the circle, um, so, uh, the, so on the picture on the left, we have points sampled from a circle, and what we would want to learn is um, what, uh, like the vanishing equations, um, what the dimension is of, this, uh, of the circle, and what the degree is. And you know the answers because, like, I took circle as an example um, just on the previous slide. Um, and uh, so, but sort of um, when when we talk about uh, um, s sort of analyzing samples uh, that uh, come from varieties, um, then 
um, of course, like inevitably, we have to deal with the question of how to sample. Um, and this is something that we didn't go um, like into like uh, details about because um, I mean somehow it's like a very complex um, issue in its own right and there are several papers that try to address it. So somehow with, like for us it was beyond the scope of what we wanted to do. Um, so sort of our assumption is we are already given a sample but then of course to make uh, tests and see um, like you know how our algorithms perform we had to be able to produce samples too um, so in certain cases this is pretty easy um, namely if V is presented by a polynomial parameterization um, then uh, what uh, so then the way to sample is uh, well we just select parameters and plug them in and get um, like uh, for like certain random values and then we get a sample this way and uh, well then the natural question is does uh, every variety have uh, such a parameterization um, and it turns out that the answer is no which is very disappointing um, for example if we take smooth plane curves of degree greater than equal three then we like we already don't have such a parameterization um, and so and uh, varieties that do admit um, parameters like such rational or um, polynomial parameterizations are called unirational um, and uh, um, so the sample we get um, as I um, as I mentioned earlier we basically select the parameter values at random plug these into the parameterization and this way produce a sample and um, uh, so the, uh, so okay so if they're not um, what you can always do is um, like you can for example with the trot curve you could select values um, on say x coordinates and then solve the equations um, and then um, and then uh, like select values from the y coordinates and then solve the, the equations for x's so, so solving equations would be like another way to produce a sample and the sample from the trot curve that you see was actually produced this way um, and although, I mean, this is um, sort of not good news, uh, but like, like in, uh, often in applications, we do deal with unirational varieties. Um, and sort of just to, um, because I'm not going to talk any more about sampling, I just want to point out um, that there are uh, papers uh, like that address these questions, for example, sampling real algebraic varieties for topological data analysis. Um, by uh, Emilia Dufresne, Parker Edwards, Heather Harrington, and Hauenstein. Um, and then something from the uniform distribution on an algebraic manifold by um, one of the co-authors like for this work, Paul Breiding um, and Marigliano, who is a graduate student at the Max Planck Institute. And there are others. Um, so these were sort of kind of aimed mostly at like the TDA audience uh, because they try to satisfy, um, at least the first one tries to satisfy um, the conditions for like, so that the density of sample is big enough that for like so certain parameter values, um, we um, get the homology um, would match the homology of the manifold. Um, okay, so um, so yeah, so we didn't go much into sampling, uh, but uh, so we are so our assumption was that we are given a sample and we have no way of increasing the size of the sample. So um, and this sa sample is relatively small. Um, so if we turn to the first question um, that uh, we started with, um, which is um, can we say, so can we say what the dimension is? Um, so this is a very important question like on the computational side uh, because if we have like so if we have a very like uh, uh, more dimensions than strictly necessary this leads to several problems um, so one is um, space needed to store the data um, because um, basically as the amount of available information increases the compression for storage purposes becomes even more important uh, then slower computation time. Um, so the computation, the speed of algorithms uh, depends on the dimension um, of the vectors. So reducing the dimensionality um, would result in reducing the computation time. And then uh, finally, uh, I guess something you've all heard of, curse of dimensionality. Um, if you have, like if you try to do classifiers, um, that can be hard if uh, the dimensionality of the input data is too high. 
Um, so this is um, so dimensionality of a data is a question that has been studied uh, a lot in the literature. So before, like you know, doing something uh, by ourselves, our first goal was to try to look into the literature and see um, what uh, uh, like what has been done. Um, and now and then there, but there is sort of a tension because. Um, a lot of times in the literature, when we look at uh, different dimension estimates, um, the estimate so um, so very often they depend on parameters, um, and then um, also they assume that we can keep increasing the size of the sample, um, which is sort of at odds with what we set ourselves as a goal, which is to analyze a sample that is fixed and that we cannot like increase at will. Um, so. Um, so, sort of to like uh, uh, to sort of um, reach some kind of a compromise. Um, what we said was we're not going to um, try to limit ourselves too much in terms of like um, uh, sort of like uh, fixing parameters, uh, but instead we're going to consider what's happening over a range of parameters, which is sort of an idea uh, very similar to persistent homology. Um, so we were looking at different dimension estimates across per different parameter values and produce dimension diagrams this way. Uh, and I'm just going to briefly, so we went through the literature and we implemented um, um, six of, uh, of these different dimension estimates. Uh, and uh, so, this, so uh, roughly, if we look at the methods for dimension estimation, um, they can be grouped into local estimates and global. Um, and so the global one that is used most is so-called PCA. Uh, so assuming that V is a linear subspace of Rn, um, we perform the following steps um, given a sample. So one is we take the mean, uh, then we take um, like a matrix of rows where we subtract the mean from the entries, and then look at the singular values of, um, of this matrix. And then finally, um, I mean, there is, there's going to be some threshold when uh, a lot of these singular values seem to be very close to zero. And you have to, so this is sort of one, like you have to decide what it is, uh, but then um, um, you declare, declare the ones um, that are not, the number of singular values that are not zero to be um, the PCA, the, the, to be the dimension um, of, um, of V. Um, and uh, then, so, and then the issue with um, principal component analysis is that we often uh, overestimate, and this is also going to show on all of these dimension um, diagrams, uh, because, for example, if you have, like, if you, um, if we are in the plane and we say sample from a circle, uh, we have some curvature, and then as soon as we have some curvature, basically, like, the data is going to be spread into dimensions, so the estimate for the dimension wouldn't be one, but it would be two. Um, but then, uh, so like one way to deal with this is to just not use PCA on the entire data set, but to first break down the sample into smaller subsamples uh, or clusters. So um, we did that actually with most of the algorithms. Um, we didn't work like uh, we didn't. We don't really have any global methods. It's like we always take clusters with single linkage clustering, um, and then we apply uh, different methods. Um, um, on the um, on um, these clusters, and then uh, av they can then take a weighted average. Um, so in the, so in case we do this uh, for PCA, uh, we get the so-called nonlinear PCA dimension, which can be computed as sort of uh, as you see in this slide. Um, so then there is another big group of dimension estimates. Um, that come uh, like that are called fractal measures. So basically, ideally, when you compare subsets, you would want to use the Hausdorff measure. Uh, I mean, the Hausdorff distance. But then, very like it's very hard to compute. So what often people do is like they try to find the lower and upper bounds, and then like which are easy to compute, and then work with those uh, lower and upper bounds. Um, so one of these is the so-called uh, box counting dimension. Um, and so what's the idea behind the box counting dimension? If we look at, um, so if we have a unit square, so this is the second one in the picture, um, and uh, we have little squares of size, uh, of length one 
uh, over epsilon, how many of squares will we need to cover the square? Well, the answer is epsilon squared. And then, so how about uh, we have a line segment, so this is on the left, of uh, length one, how many um, little segments of length one over epsilon will we need? Well, epsilon, ah, okay, so there's a typo over here. And then we can continue and we can do the same thing for a cube. So suppose we have um, a cube and uh, like, a, um, like a, uh, sort of where the sides are one by one by one, and then we cover it with little um, cubes where each side is one over epsilon. How many will we need? Um, epsilon cubed. Um, so one thing that we can see is now if we take the log of the number of these, um, um, like of um, the cubes or like whatever that we will need and divide um, over the side, um, then we're going to get uh, minus the dimension. Um, and so, so and it's really this sort of exponent that we're after. Um, and so if we now, um, so, so if we now, um, and of course, um, like, so the issue can be, um, so technically, um, this dimension would be computed by taking a limit um, of like over epsilons is that um, over epsilons is the 10 to zero, but then uh, this is a luxury that we don't have. Um, so um, uh, yeah, so um, uh, bec because so, so somehow like if, if we have a finite subset, then like this measure um, would be like the box counting dimension is going to be zero. Uh, but then, um, um, but then so the, uh, the estimate that we use is written over here. Basically, we take our sample, uh, we divide um, the, we divide it into boxes, um, and then um, we look at the number of boxes that contain the points from the sample um, over um, uh, so log of the points um, that are uh, of, of points um, that are included in these. Uh, I mean, of the number uh, over log of the lengths uh, and ne negative one. Um, and we don't let this tend to um, zero, we just look at what happens um, over epsilons. Um, so then there is uh, the so-called persistent homology curve dimension estimate, which um, was introduced by uh, a group at, uh, by Hen Henry Adams. Now they have a, a, a paper um, on archive about this. Um, and uh, uh, yes, uh, uh, yeah, so this is so this is work from Colorado State. Um, so uh, we like tweaked it just a little bit, but like the ideas are from their paper. Um, so in this case, we partition um, our sample into clusters again using single linkage clustering, and then on each subsample we construct a minimal spanning tree, um, and then. Uh, so if like if we look at the formula, so for each subsample separately, what we take is going to be um, uh, uh, sort of uh, like we add the edges um, over the number of uh, uh, like over the number uh, and then um, like we have logs everywhere. Um, and uh, so uh, and then, of course, to get the estimate for the big sample, we take away that average of this. And actually, so there is um, um, Schweinhardt, uh, so, so how would we think about persistent homology and the connection uh, to the, these fractal dimensions? There actually, uh, Schweinhardt, um, who's at Ohio State, wrote like a couple of papers um, about persistent homology in the box counting dimension when they coincide. Um, and there's actually, um, so the, in higher dimensions, but then um, for dimension one, there are known results from before that like that established the connection, um, so it's sort of it, it, like it, it, it's sort of not as unnatural as it might seem. Um, okay, so I'm just uh, going to show you now a couple of examples, and also um, I want to point out that um, like with these estimates, so when we do single linkage clustering, of course we need the distance in the ambient space. Um, and then depending on whether our variety lives in a projective space or Euclidean space, we have two metrics that we can choose from. So the standard Euclidean distance in like Euclidean space and uh, Fubini studi in projective space. Um, so we implemented, uh, so then there are other estimates, but just for the sake of time, I'm not gonna go through all of them, but they're very carefully described in our paper. Um, where we like, and we also give the like references, um, but um, um, but uh, 
uh, basically, um, if we so we implemented all of these in terms of these uh, what we call the dimension diagrams. So you can see that we didn't select. Um, I mean. Uh, we didn't pick a particular epsilon and then like spit like uh, have uh, um, software spit out a number, but we looked at sort of the behavior. Uh, so if we take a variety of three by four matrices of rank two, uh, so this we know is a projective variety of dimension nine, um, and uh, we uh, so and this naturally lives in a projective space. So sort of you would so the natural metric would be the Fubini studi. Um, and indeed, somehow, if we look at the pictures on the left hand side, uh, we have estimates from like for Euclidean space. And on the right hand side, uh, we have estimates for projective space. And um, so neither look particularly good. Uh, but uh, you like but still, it seems that like um, in Euclidean space, it, like it's much worse because basically like the graphs are all over the place, um, whereas uh, in the case like uh, in the projective case, um, they, they, they seem to be closer to what we know the value is. Um, and then, um, uh, and also, so if you look at the light blue, because I said it's sort of the issue of overestimating, uh, NPCA is basically always quite high um, above other graphs, um, and, and including in this case. So this is a sample from SO3. Um, and uh, like if we, if we look, you actually see that sort of three of these estimates are um, very close to three over a range of epsilons. And this is, in fact, the true dimension. Um, but NPCA, again, overestimates and sort of like according to NPCA, you would say it's seven. Um, OK, so um, and then uh, so this was sort of like the first um, the, the first at attempt at estimating the dimension. Um, and over here, we haven't used any information, uh, like, I mean, sort of the information that we have, which is that we know that um, the sample came from a variety. So if we now uh, move on um, to persistent homology, um, so how can we use, uh, say, this information for persist, like uh, information in per like uh, from varieties in persistent homology? Um, so just in case somebody doesn't know yet, uh, on the left hand side we have a sample from the trot curve, and persistent homology um, uh, basically, like the idea is that you have these points and then you thicken them and then you see um, and then you keep t for different thickenings, um, you keep track of uh, how component, connected components merge and how loops appear and disappear. So in dimension one, so what we see over here in dimension one is interesting because on one hand, so when you see the picture, you would say, yeah, so I have, um, I have four loops in the, like in the space I'm sampling from. Um, and indeed, um, if we thicken uh, just slightly, then, I mean, we get four bars in our barcode. Um, but then um, once these ovals are filled in, um, they, are, they are arranged around the circle. So um, for like a little, slightly larger value of epsilon, another, um, another uh, bar appears that persists for a while and then until sort of the this circle that they form is filled in. So the information that we get is on one hand, yes, we have four ovals, but they're also arranged around the circle, which is then the additional fifth bar. Um, and uh, so one thing that we implemented is um, so we uh, so if we think about thickening points, um, well, in, like uh, if you have varieties um, and if you're not in a singular point, uh, then what you can do is like you can take the like you, if you have vanishing polynomials, you can take the tangent space. Uh, and then instead of sort of for points growing balls around them, um, you can. Uh, you can um, t uh, put place ellipsoids um, along the tangent directions. And then the idea would be, if you do this, then uh, the topological features will persist for longer. Um, and I mean, and effectively, uh, so our software also includes uh, Irene, uh, which was developed by Greg Henselman. Um, and uh, so the only thing you have to give is the distance matrix, and then it sort of assumes that and then it builds via torus rips complexes on top of that. Um, and if you do ellipsoids versus balls, um, that just means that you, um, I mean, that, that uh, like you have to calculate distances slightly differently. 
Um, okay, so uh, so what happens now if we uh, place ellipsoids along tangent spaces versus if we just thicken points uh, by a certain radius? Um, on the left-hand side, uh, we have um, the, what we call ellipsoid-driven simplicial complex, and on the right-hand side, the standard Vietori strips. And what we can see is that on the left-hand side, the, fe like the features persist for longer, especially sort of um, in the dimension one, um, there's a noticeable dif uh, difference. Um, but now, of course, the question is, okay, so I'm showing you this and I'm saying um, you can strengthen your topological signal with this, uh, but how do we compute it? Um, and, uh, so, and, and so, and this is sort of one of the questions that was posed in the very beginning, uh, namely, um, if we have a sample, we want to learn, uh, like we want to know what the vanishing equations are. Um, so the ca one caveat is that we're going to have to specify um, like what degree of vanishing polynomials we're looking for. And also the assumption that we made is that uh, we have very little noise when we sample. Um, and so with these two assumptions, what we can do is we can construct the so-called multivariate Vandermont matrix. Um, and then compute the vanishing, um, uh, basically the coefficients for um, the vanishing uh, polynomials um, as the kernel of this matrix. Um, and so this is one of the things that we implemented in our package, and um, we used three different methods for computing uh, the kernel, the SVD, QR, and uh, uh, reduced row echelon form. Um, and the, the difference between them is um, one gives us sparse spaces, uh, one give, like, you know, dense spaces and somewhere in between, sort of depending on how many polynomials, like, you wish, uh, yeah, like, w what polynomials you wish to see um, in uh, then the basis. Um, okay, so we can, uh, so given a sample, uh, we can now find vanishing polynomials um, of a specified uh, degree. Um, and then one thing that we can already do now is we can use persistent homology on top of it with these ellipsoid-driven complexes and strengthen the signal. Um, and, um, and actually sort of, I mean, in general, if you have um, manifolds, like you can uh, estimate like tangent spaces and still use this, even if you don't have the vanishing equations. But like uh, what's available um, right now uh, in uh, our software package is that you first, that you are given a sample that you, com that you know comes from a variety, you compute vanishing polynomials, and then you use that uh, to construct these ellipsoid complexes. Um, but now, uh, once we have polynomials, uh, then we can go further. And um, because like, uh, and there, there's a lot of different, uh, like there's a lot of software available uh, that algebraic geometries developed that help you compute things straight from polynomials. Um, and this sort of makes you go back to the question um, of dimension, uh, of the degree, and then like also um, of finding irreducible components. Um, and uh, so uh, sort of, and what I'm going to do now is, uh, I'm, uh, uh, so the, uh, I'm going to show um, a couple of examples and um, sort of talk a little bit about the software um, and uh, so that you can see what you can then do with this extra information. Um, in particular, um, Bertini um, is, uh, so is very popular um, and um, given, um, given vanishing polynomials, uh, it can be used to um, compute the dimension, the degree, and uh, these uh, ir like, um, irreducible components. Um, and what we did was uh, we wrote uh, we wrote a wrapper uh, a wrapper so that it can be used um, so that it can be used uh, like from Julia. Um, so I have to say um, so right now uh, like uh, all the so if, like in Julia um, all the uh, so our uh, package is updated as um, as is Irene. Um, the only thing that might vary slightly um, are the commands that I still have written here uh, because this 
change took place only recently. Uh, but if you go to, so uh, the software is available on GitHub. Um, so, so this you can, so this you can still find in our paper. Uh, but basically, you can clone um, the the package. Uh, and then uh, there's also like a little tutorial where it says like the commands that work for the current version of the software. Um, but but basically what we, like what you do is you um, go to GitHub, uh, you down like you clone the package, um, and then and then you use it. And um, what do you what so what does it accept? Um, the data set is given as a matrix whose columns are the data points e1 through um in Rn. Um, and then, of course, if we want to use this with Bertini, then you have to download Bertini 2 um, and um, download the wrapper for Julia. Um, so we uh, we were looking at different examples, and I said we did produce some of the samples ourselves, um, and all of the data sets that we looked at are also included as part of the package. So this is one of the commands that has changed, just uh, like for heads up. Um, and uh, so first we're going to look, uh, we're going to revisit SO3. Uh, so to produce the sample from SO3, we sampled a, a three by three matrix from a standard Gaussian and then took, took Q, uh, Q in the QR decomposition. Um, so, and then if we ask ourselves, first, the di uh, first, what is the dimension of this variety? Um, this is the picture that uh, um, that I've shown you before, and here we sort of see that a lot of the estimates are sort of clustered at around three. But now we want to do more than that. I mean, now we want to um, sort of combine. Uh, so, like, so this, so this is good, sort of, to get an impression of what's happening. Uh, but now we want, we want to actually find um, vanishing polynomials. Uh, so for that, there is a command find equations, and um, so, um, and it takes. Uh, like the data set for one, um, you decide what method you use, uh, Q or SVD or a reduced or echelon form, you have to specify and what, uh, 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 of what degree polynom vanishing polynomials you're looking for, in this case too. Um, and then there's also an option of, um, because we were, I said we have projective and we have real varieties, um, so false means that we look at uh, real, like we're looking for uh, polynomials um, that define uh, that are not not necessarily homogeneous. Whereas, whereas if you set it to true, um, you're going to be searching among homogeneous polynomials. Um, and so, if you use this command on a sample that we produced, uh, then we get a list of 20 polynomials that vanish on the sample um, and look like here, like there are two two first one uh, first ones that appear on the list. Um, and we then uh, what we did was. Uh, so we use like all the different methods um, for dimensions two, and then we went to three and four, um, and uh, we then uh, we then calculated the numbers for Macaulay two, and in this case for the sample uh, we we got the right number of vanishing polynomials, which is sort of a confirmation. Um, and then um, as I said, so now like that we have um, vanishing polynomials, um, we want to also take advantage of the software that we have available like from algebraic geometers namely Bertini um, and so uh, so uh, uh, if we use that uh, then Bertini reports the dimension um, coming sort of if, if we take these polynomials uh, of the underlying varieties three um, and also it is irreducible and the degree is eight so this is sort of the extra information um, that uh, I, I was talking about um, and then, um, as far as uh, SO3 goes, um, when we were looking at barcodes, um, we didn't um, we, like we didn't really have um, that much success. Um, like uh, so, we tried uh, we, we we tried both complexes, Vitoris rips and this, the ellipsoid driven complex, uh, but um, um, our sample was not dense enough to reveal structure. Um, and like in any of these cases, um, I mean, and even if it was like dense enough, then the issue is still uh, that persistent homology. Once you get to dimension three, um, it's going to be hard to compute, very uh, computationally demanding. Okay, so then the next sample comes from a uh, comes from the Segre variety. Um, so what we do here is we sample two standard Gaussian matrices of format two times one and one times three and multiply them. 
Um, so then we get um, rank two, um, uh, rank one, two by three matrices. Um, and if we look at, uh, so this is also one dimension diagram from before, uh, but this was more to demonstrate that um, um, when we have a projective variety, it does make sense to not always use Euclidean distance, but actually um, um, sort of use Fubini Studi. Um, and we did the same thing then for, uh, for computing persistent homology, because so um, Irene, like in a lot of, uh, in Ripster, for example, they, like, uh, they, uh, they um, take the distance matrix, um, and uh, if you have of something that naturally lives in the projective space, it makes sense to consider um, Fubini Studi also for computing persistent homology. Um, so then, uh, um, so I, I stress the entire time that we are now in a perfect setting. Uh, we have a sample that from variety, and we assume that there is very, like, there's basically, like, no noise. I mean, or rather, that um, the only noise there is is due to rounding. Um, and uh, so, sort of, like, the most noisy case that we looked at was um, was a sample uh, of 6,040 points from the confirmation space of the cyclooctane. Um, so, uh, and this data set is available through JavaPlex, um, um, this JavaPlex tutorial uh, by um, Adams and Tausch. Um, so what do I mean by confirmation space? So over here we have um, our like a cyclooctane. Um, we have um, eight uh, carbon atoms and like to each are uh, two like and then two hydrogen atoms um, bound to each of these. And then um, the question is of so like if we so if we think about it, um, this this naturally lives in. Um, R24, because on one hand, uh, we have to determine the coordinate of each of the carbons, and then somehow the hydrogens are fixed. So for each of the, um, for each of the carbons, like uh, for each like um, triplet, we have R3, so then like together um, R24. Um, and then, so then the question is um, of, so um, how, like how are these, uh, like how, can, how, um, uh, what spatial arrangements um, can we observe? And um, like on the uh, on like to the left in the picture, we have something that we call a chair boat. And then if, like in the middle, there is a chair chair. And then on the right, there is boat boat. Um, so these are um, all uh, all different conformations of uh, this like um, of the cyclooctane. Um, and and this is uh, an out. So if we look, but if we look at this space of conformations, um, it is an algebraic variety uh, because um, so uh, be, I mean and b basically uh, so the equations that define it are given by looking at um, at distances. Um, so uh, in particular, if we look at the last line, um, the squared distances have to satisfy two formulas. Um, and so the cyclooctane. So there are two papers uh, by Brown, Martin, uh, by Brown and Martin. One algorithmic dimensionality reduction for mole molecular structure analysis, and then by Martin and other co-authors, topology of cyclooctane energy landscapes. Um, so uh, they sort of studied the conformation space and and uh, and say that what it is is a union of a sphere with the Klein bottle glued together along two circles of singularities. And um, somehow, for the persistent homology, uh, I mean, for the TDA community, um, this was one of the first uh, examples of uh, where they use persistent homology, um, so, sort of uh, to compute, uh, to, to, comp to sort of uh, give a guess about what the homology of this uh, of the conformation space will be. And um, so, um, Afra Zomorodian did this a while ago. Um, so it, it, it kind of felt fitting to like return to the same example and, and see what we get in our case. Um, so we didn't um, we didn't uh, like we didn't work with uh, the whole sample of 6,040 uh, points, but instead uh, we took a subsample. Um, and uh, so what we can see um, over here uh, is the dimension diagram. 
um, for uh, like for uh, so the dimension uh, diagram uh, for this subsample um, as, for the six methods that we implemented. Uh, so we have uh, and somehow like uh, I mean at least just like looking at it, uh, it is sort of um, it's less than five clearly. Um, but we know, in fact, in this particular case, that the true dimension is true. Uh, but then, uh, sort of, the reason why we wanted to look at this example is um, to uh, see, uh, like, uh, to look at uh, persistent homology and see if we get, like, if we indeed um, sort of confirm uh, that uh, uh, Betty that uh, um, Betty um, zero is one, Betty one is one, and Betty two is two. Uh, and so we still work with the subsample, a, a random subsample, and we tried um, both Irene, so the standard Victoria's rips, and the ellipsoid complex for this subsample. Um, and over here, it turns out sort of that uh, with the Victoria's rips, uh, we didn't really catch any structure in dimensions uh, one and two. Um, but that's but uh, in the, like if we use ellipsoid complexes, I mean because so this we know is a variety, uh, then we do see sort of one long bar in dimension one and uh, two like two long long bars in dimension uh, two. Um, yeah, and this is sort of all I had to say. So like thank you so much for your attention.